A number of years before, actually many years before I became a macho biologist, I used to explore the wetland ditches at a summer camp that I would go to north of Toronto, Canada, where I grew up. And uh, I would find frogs there, dragonflies. I was always fascinated by animals. If I was having a really good day, I might actually see a snake. One day, a thin, scruffy man ambled along the tracks, and he um, had in one hand a dip net and a sack, and uh, in the other hand, he had a leopard frog. And he walked up to me, and he asked me if I would hold the leopard frog for him. So I did. And he waded off into this ditch, wet ditch, to obviously catch some more frogs. And I didn't know why he was catching frogs, but I didn't especially like their prospects. And I stood there looking at this frog in my hand, and I began to see things from the frog's perspective. And I was overcome with a compelling urge to let the frog go, so I did. And the man came back, saw what I had done, he was very angry, shouted at me. I learned some new swear words that day. <laughs> and then he uh, headed on his way, and I felt humiliated. It was very much against my nature to disobey an order, for, especially from an adult. But I, I'm glad I did. And um, I, I, I felt then, as I do now, that I had done the right thing. I don't know what the, the, the um, fate of those frogs was going to be, because he had other frogs in the bag. They may have been used for fishing bait, or it's quite likely they will have ended up on the dissection trade to be used for high school students to learn things like uh, what does, uh, what's the relationship between the intestine and the stomach uh, what does uh, a frog's leg muscle, gastronemius muscle, feel like? Those students will also learn the oldest lesson in the book when it comes to our relationship with animals, and that is that they were put here for us, and they are for us to do with as we please. I use the phrase, might makes right, to describe this doctrine, this way of thinking. Might Makes Right has a long and rich history in, in human social culture. Might Makes Right was used, thinking was used to justify or to defend colonialism, the slave trade, the subjugation of women's rights, and the denial of civil rights. We've done a great deal to relegate these past social injustices to the history books, but there's one huge area in which we humans continue to operate on a might makes right relationship to other sentient beings. You all know what I'm referring to, of course. It is our relationship to them, the animals. We kill 100 or so, more than 100 million a year for hunting and sport. We kill 50 million or so in fur factories. We deprive animals of their most basic needs so we can do harmful experiments, experiments that we would never do on our own species. We keep them in the most appalling conditions to take products from their bodies. We put them in factory farms, uh, tiny places where clearly these animals have no opportunity to fulfill their basic biological needs. We kill 300 chickens a second in this country. Uh, we deprive calves of their mothers so that we can drink not share the milk with the mother. I mean, we can argue about how natural milk is a food. I certainly don't think it's a very natural food. Just read up the statistics on pus counts is, is quite surprising. Um, but we, we take these things from their bodies. And the reward for the mother cow at the end of several cycles of being artificially inseminated and having her calf taken away is to be sent to the slaughterhouse. Well, what's wrong with all of this? The issue here is that animals are sentient. That is, they have the capacity to feel things, pains, pleasures. They can have good days and bad. They can suffer. And probably few people in this room needs convincing of that. So I want to talk about animal sentience. I want to go through some of the characteristics that animals have that I think help to win people over. I am a scientist. I'm an ethologist. The study of animal behavior is my specialty. So we use the tools that we have to advocate for animals. And my tools are science and the study of animal behavior, so my books tend to focus on that, um, that, that area. And the first point I want to make here is that animals are diverse. They have different ways of orienting to their surroundings. Sentience is a beautiful, rich thing. Um, you know, there's a famous paper by Thomas Nagel, a philosopher, what is it like to be a bat? What is it like indeed to be a bat? It's kind of mystery to us. How, what is it like to orient and to recognize different insects uh, and their textures just by listening to echoes, a stunning 
a stunningly different way of orienting to the world than what we have. We may be able to relate a little bit more to rainbow lorikeets. Um, they, they have a more visual world, view of the world, and they behave in ways that may, we may relate to. They can feel love uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, fishes, commonly disregarded as automatons, and I'm gonna, I don't know if actually in this talk I'm talking about much about fish, but I can assure you I write a lot about fishes. Uh, we've had it totally wrong with fish. There's so much going on in their social lives and their worlds. So sentience, uh, let me just back up a second. Um, a really key point I wanna make here is that sentience does not align smoothly with intelligence or awareness of things like that, okay? They're related, um, but it, it's, not, it's not like the more intelligent you are, the more sentient that you are. At least that's, that's the common assumption we make, but I think it's a false assumption. This is not a new idea. Humphrey Primat, the British cleric of the 18th century said, and you can probably all read, and I think the text is probably large enough in the back, but I'm gonna commit a sin of a speaker and actually read my slide. Superiority of rank or station exempts no creature from the sensibility of pain nor does inferiority render the feelings thereof the less exquisite. Lovely 18th century, somewhat flowery language. British biologist, thank you, John Webster, contemporary, um, used, uh, put it a little bit more bluntly. He said, people have assumed intelligence is linked to the ability to suffer, and that because animals have smaller brains, they suffer less than humans. That is a pathetic piece of logic. We tend to be intellicentric. We tend to be intelligence focused in our view of who's worthy and who isn't. We, we, we really often talk about intelligence as sort of the pinnacle. Very convenient for us, we tend to regard ourselves as the most intelligent. And in many areas, I think it's a fair assumption that we are. We happen to have maybe gotten a little lucky in the evolutionary sweepstakes. We have this coevolved uh, brain and hands. Uh, but you know, we don't have any choice of what kind of species we're born as. Uh, and I think that needs to inform how we look at other animals as well. Well, here's a blank slide. Uh, you are about to see the numbers one to nine. I'm going to illustrate an area of raw intelligence in which an animal, it happens to be the common chimpanzee, uh, excels far beyond our abilities. So just, this is something that most people need to be aware of, that, and they aren't, and that is that we aren't even the most intelligent in some of the most basic raw intelligence measures. Animals do th amazing things that we, we, our brains simply can't, echolocation in the bats, for instance. So here you go, you're gonna get to see nine numbers, try to memorize where they were in about one second. Okay. <laughs> By the way, you can watch YouTube videos of all this kind of stuff. Thank goodness for YouTube nowadays. Um, so. The average human on seeing numbers for that long, I'll even let you look at them again, gets to about three or four, if, oh, by the way, the, 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 the challenge is to point to each number in order, point to each um, rectangle after you've seen the numbers, okay? And ch we get to three or four if we're having a good day. Uh, younger children will do better than older people, and um, younger chimpanzees will do better than older chimpanzees, but chimps will get it right pretty much 100% of the time with one second. If they get one-fifth of a second, they get it right about 90% of the time. If we get to maybe two, that's a pretty stellar day. In fact, the, the brain, the best brain of Britain, a guy named Ben Pridmore, who can memorize a deck of cards in 30 seconds, a shuffle deck of cards in 30 seconds, uh, he did about a third as well as Ayumu, who's one of the, these talented chimps who can do this. And there's a picture of Ayumu performing this task. Again, you can watch it on YouTube video. And by the way, there's no pride, no ego with this. I don't know if chimps can have ego. I think they might be able to. Um, but it's, they just want that little treat. And it's just a, a sort of game they're doing. Uh, they're not patting each other on the back. It's pretty casual, but it's really stunning to see how well they do. Another way our intellicentrism plays out is that we tend to um, dismiss animals uh, as dumb, particularly animals we're planning to eat. Uh, it's thought that uh, people often think that turkeys are stupid because they will, a turkey tom will uh, mate, try to mount and try to mate with a, um, a stuffed model of a female turkey. I have two words for anyone who thinks that that means they're not intelligent. Inflatable doll. We also have a patronizing way of viewing animals' intelligence through our own lens. We know about our own intelligence, 
and we have certain things that we're good at. So we give them IQ tests. Well, IQ tests don't mean very much to a parrot or a bat. Um, for a long time, it was thought that chimpanzees had rather poor face recognition skills until someone had the brilliant idea of actually testing them on chimpanzee faces. We just assumed all along that our faces are far more distinctive. Well, we're humans. We live among other humans. Of course, our faces are more distinctive. But lo and behold, when chimps are tested on chimp faces, faces that they relate to, that they've been looking at through their evolutionary history, they actually can recognize chimp faces just as well as we can recognize human faces. Incidentally, they also recognize upside down faces better than we do. And if you think about the biology of chimpanzees, <laughs> you can appreciate why they might be good at that. But other animals have their skills. Clark's nutcrackers, which is, by the way, related to this uh, scrub jay here, uh, they can, they've been known to, it's been shown they can remember the locations of 33,000 things they buried during the summer months so that they can revisit and access those things during the winter. Um, pretty stunning. They don't go back to all of them, and actually that's probably a nice little co-evolutionary relationship to the animals. They've sowed the seeds, and thanks to memory, mortality, and, and just, uh, and, or just, more buried than can be need, are needed, uh, that actually helps in this relationship. I love the synergy of nature, and by the way, I write about that a lot. I think we have the wrong view about nature's competitive and it's all about dominance and this sort of thing. That happens in nature, but there's a lot of synergy and cooperation, so I wanted to get a little word in for that because I don't know if I'll mention that again. Episodic memory is the ability to remember the what, the when, and the where of a past event. And uh, it's been shown in a number of species. But this is one of these things on a formerly long list of, of, of capacities that were thought to be unique to humans, culture, language, episodic memory. Um, it's been shown that scrub jays, well, let me give you this study, describe this study in a bit of detail. Scrub jays are a caching species. That is, they bury food, and they come back later to recover it. You can imagine, it wouldn't be very adaptive to be a caching species if you didn't have a good memory. <laughs> You'd be doing the plants a favor, but you wouldn't be doing yourself. In fact, natural selection dictates that they're going to have good memories because birds who have a good memory are going to recover their caches. They're going to get more nutrition. They're more likely to raise young, young with genes that code for good memory. Natural selection for episodic memory. It may not be useful to hedgehogs. I don't know. Uh, but it's useful to scrub jays, and so lo and behold, they have good episodic memory. This particular study involved two kinds of food that they like to eat, peanuts and wax worms. Okay? Uh, another little thing you should know is they prefer waxworms to peanuts. Sorry about the waxworms. And a third bit of information is that, oh yes, waxworms have a shorter shelf life than peanuts. They decay sooner. So on day one of this experiment, in fact, they, they decay after about five days. So day one of the experiment, uh, the birds were given a little bowl of peanuts. These were one at a time, tested one at a time, and they had uh, one or two arenas in front of them. One arena was open, the other one wasn't available. They had sand, so they could bury the peanuts. So the bird would then go into the available arena and bury the peanuts. I imagine the birds were fed, so they were not hungry at the time. And then a little bit later, maybe an hour later, they were given some waxworms, and they, this, this arena now was closed off, and the waxworms were uh, buried by the birds on the other side, cached there. And then, depending on how much time has elapsed between that bear, the caching event and the opportunity to recover the food, the birds made different choices. If it had been just six hours or a day, the birds would go back, and if they had access to both arenas now, you can guess which one they're going to go to. Waxworms, they prefer those to peanuts. But 20, 124 hours or more, about five days or more, if they get access to two arenas, you probably can guess where they're going to go because you also have episodic memory. They're going to go to the peanuts. And by the way, scientists are very careful about controlling for their studies um, and, and explaining other possible eventualities. Perhaps the scrub jays can just simply smell that it smells rank uh, of these ro now rotten waxworms. So what they did was they actually replaced the rotten waxworms uh, before and replaced them with fresh ones before they had the birds another opportunity. And new sand, by the way, as well. Uh, they still would go to the peanuts after that elapse of time. So they weren't relying on smell. And many birds don't have a particularly good sense of smell. So they have episodic memory. I won't describe the study I do in the book of how meadow voles have been also shown to use episodic memory, but uh, they have it as well. And this is a small rodent, another manifestation of our prejudices towards animals, we tend to categorize. You know, you rearrange the, word, the letters, two letters in the word uh, pets, and you have the word pest. Uh, totally different outlook, totally different treatment, totally different view of those animals, even though they're probably no different in terms of sentience. Uh, anyway, this small, small rodent 
The little sedan of the mammal world has episodic memory. By the way, this book, this picture, I think, is going to be on the back cover of this book that Mike mentioned, Exultant, The Exultant Ark. It's a pictorial tour of animal pleasure. I think animal pleasure is such an important subject, and it, it really lends itself well to a pictorial coffee book, coffee table book type presentation. And I do mention the word vegan in this book in a very positive way. So I hope it reaches a wide audience. <laughs> <laughs>